this morning I'm starting this video in downtown Athens to show the double barrel cannon designed by John Gilland. He's buried in Oconee Hill Cemetery, which we'll be at shortly, but this is the actual cannon that he designed, the only prototype, and it is here on the northeast corner of the courthouse in Athens. I always make a point to tell people about this because I just think it's a really unique thing. The cannon was designed in the Civil War era and the issue was that they were never able to get both cannons to fire at the same time. There was a ball in each cannon attached by a chain and the idea was to mow down the enemy like a wheat field. This morning we're here at Oconee Hill Cemetery in Athens, Georgia. The cemetery was organized in 1855. It finally opened in the fall of 1856. We're overlooking West Hill right now. In the background there, that is Sanford Stadium. If you're a fan of the Bulldogs, that's where they play. I'm much happier on this side of the tracks though. This is yet another cemetery that was founded back in the Victorian era and was modeled after Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts. One of the first things you come across in this cemetery is the water trowel for horses. On it it reads, A righteous man regardeth the life of his beast. Back in the 1800s, you'd show up on your horse and you might have been thirsty. And they provided a source of water for them. Today I brought with me my Oconee Hill Cemetery book. This book lists all the obituaries and the history of the cemetery. And at the start of the video where I showed the double barrel cannon, this is John Gillen. He is the man that designed that double barrel cannon. This monument here is the monument for Blanton M. Hill. One of my favorite things about my Oconee Hill Cemetery book is we can look up how he died. He's there about in the middle of the frame and I went through this book and all the gruesome deaths and interesting deaths and just all sorts of interesting history. I underlined or starred it. This man was killed at Deep Bottom, Virginia during the Civil War. This monument here with the three women on top. Each of the three women represent a particular thing. The woman on the right holding the cross represents faith. The woman on the left holding the anchor represents hope. And the woman standing in the middle with the outstretched palm represents charity. In the book it also talks about the substantial fence that goes around the plot. The monument was carved in Atlanta, Georgia. And in the book it talks about how this monument was anywhere to $1,500 to $2,000. So in between this cemetery and the stadium runs a railroad track and there's all sorts of history in between this cemetery and that railroad track, how they've built trestles. But one of the things that you'll notice as you're walking around and especially down on the lower road is a lot of these monuments have slowly dilapidated. In the book it talks about how the vibrations from the railroad has caused some of that. Especially on that lower road you can really see it. We're still kind of up on the hill. This is the walkway over here between Sanford Stadium, the railroad track, and West Hill. I just think this little walk right here is really pretty. This shot here may give a little bit representation of what I was talking about with how the railroad has affected some of these monuments, some of these family plots. You can see the stadium in the background, the railroads to the left. And this is the backside of West Hill. A lot of these retaining walls have slowly started to fall apart over the years. In the book, it talks about how that is due to the vibrations of the railroad. This is the historic African-American burial grounds. It's on the back side of West Hill. Many of the records of the cemetery were lost in the late 1800s. Back then, if you were the sexton of the cemetery, you were the sexton for life. And the board of the cemetery wanted to change that. And forgive me if I'm not getting this history exactly right. It's been a while since I've read it. They wanted to make it to where you were elected to be a sexton and you weren't that for life. And it became a political battle and one way or another, there was a fire in the house of the sexton. A lot of the records were lost of that time. And now you're elected. Directly adjacent to the African American section is the Pauper's Burial Ground. If you came into town or you were poor or one way or another, if you didn't have money to be buried, they'd bury you here. One of the obituaries within the book talks about how there was a man that was mangled by the railroad. He was about 25 and all they could find in his pockets was a copy of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, a bar of soap, and a comb. So West Hills to our left and across the street is the valley section of the cemetery. And this long cast iron fence here is for the Cobb family. This large obelisk is for Howell Cobb. 
He was a speaker of the house in the 1800s. Here on the West Hill, you'll find the receiving vault, which was a typical site in cemeteries of this time. One of the last uses of this receiving vault was to hold caskets while they were renovating burial plots. Here's a good shot of the Sexton's house. This is now an office of the cemetery. There's been a couple different Sexton's houses here over the course of the history of the cemetery. One of them was involved in the fire in the late 1890s. At one time they moved this house 50 feet and thus created the north slope which you see just before it. Behind the house there's some stone walls for a garden for the Sexton. This is the grave of Ellison D. Stone. His obituary read that he officiated more weddings than any other man in Georgia. Directly behind the Sexton's house is the factory burial grounds. This was the burial grounds for people that worked at the Athens Manufacturing Company. So if you worked there and you died, they had a section here in Oconee Hill for you to be buried. This is the grave of Jacob Finzi and his family. I believe the stone monument of the woman there was his daughter. This man was born in the 1700s, which is a rare sight here in Georgia. Given the death dates on this monument, they died before the founding of this cemetery. And while I'm speculating, I wouldn't be surprised if these guys were originally buried in Jackson Street Cemetery, which is the older cemetery in downtown Athens. And then when this cemetery was founded, they were moved here. Look at this tiny little fire hydrant. In my time coming to this cemetery, I've always been drawn to this corner lot here on the East Hill near the bridge. When I first came here, this iron fencing was all destroyed. Over the years, Oconee Hill has suffered from a lot of bouts of vandalism. In November 1963, a young man came through the cemetery and destroyed over 70 some odd monuments. The book describes that he was mourning his father's death. And this is one of the lots that was hit the hardest. This fence used to be all broken up and dilapidated. And here recently they've restored the fence and some of the monuments within this plot. There's a headless statue within this plot that I always love to come and see. This is the Lucas Monument on the top of East Hill. Originally this lot was enclosed by an iron fence due to the magnolia tree here to the left dropping some of its branches on that iron fence. It was removed in the 1980s. Also on top of the mausoleum there used to be statues over the years, it was damaged by vandals. This monument cost $6,439, and originally they paid for it in Confederate money. After the Civil War, the Philadelphia firm that built this monument ordered the executor of the estate to pay in U.S. greenbacks. This seems to be one of the only remnants of the iron fencing that used to surround this plot. When you drive through this cemetery, your eyes can really be drawn to this monument. One thing I'm really enjoying this morning as I'm walking through the cemetery, I just find a monument that I like, and I'm able to find that in the book and read about it. The tall white marble monument in the center is the grave of Stevens Thomas and his wife Isabella. Stevens Thomas graduated with A.H. Stevens. There's a state park named for A.H. Stevens. Buried in this plot is their son, who died from a morphine overdose. He thought he was taking quinine and instead took morphine, and he was found dead the next morning. This monument here is for Annie, who is the only daughter of WMH and Mary B. Waddle. Local legend says that the mother did not accept this monument and it sat by the river for years. A photograph of Annie's face was supposed to be used to model this angel. And between that and Annie's last name not being on the monument, it's thought that that's why the mother did not accept this monument. In the background there is the Sexton's house and this is the factory burial grounds that I've mentioned. And right adjacent to it is the Jewish section. This is the Congregation Children of Israel Cemetery. It's maintained by the congregation and was originally purchased adjacent to the lot for Oconee Hill in 1855. I was wandering down at the bottom checking out the mausoleums and I'd seen pictures of this in the book but I've never been able to find this monument and I was really excited when I saw it. It's a relief of some dolphins. Over here in this Jewish section, something that I've mentioned in a previous video that there's a good example of. 
is there's a little basket of stones here and it's shaped like the Star of David. It's a tradition in Jewish cemeteries to come and place a stone on the grave of who you're visiting. And so they've got a basket here in case you forget to bring one. They've got another little tiny fire hydrant over here. I think these are kind of funny. Down here in the Jewish section is another little run here of some large monuments. I'm always drawn to this row here. One cool thing about this tree trunk monument here is nestled in it is a broken axe handle. This monument here is for Norma Marks Morris. You can see it started to sink because you can see her birth date there, but not her death date. The home that she lived in is now the Sigma Alpha Epsilon Fraternity House. This obelisk here is for Simon Marks. In 1888, after he was buried, there was a grave robber that came and disturbed his grave. Here's a good example of some of the destruction that can be caused by falling limbs from trees. I've come to the newer section of Oconee Hill, and if you're a fan of the Bulldogs, there's a section here called Bulldog Haven. One of the most recent burials here in Bulldog Haven is of Vince Dooley. He was a coach of the Georgia Bulldogs. My Uncle Tommy played for the Georgia Bulldogs back in the day, and when he died, Vince came to his viewing. I'm always really impressed with this mausoleum here. I just love the rounded dome top, and also how small it is. It's a very narrow mausoleum. I imagine the reason being is just because there's a single man buried here, Mr. James Smith. One of my favorite monuments here in the newer section is this Marshall stone. It is shaped like a book. I've come back to the old section just to film the parting shot here of the valley section of the cemetery. There's lots more stories to be told, but for now I'll end the video here.